let's start with the big one, the, the Copenhagen conference. Well, I think Barack Obama said it was a, a, I forget the exact words, but something, I quote them in the book, a dramatic step forward. Of course, it wasn't an important step forward. It, it was a fiasco. Um, that said, I do think that uh, Mr. Obama and other political leaders need to have a national climate policy. A leader of a country's most sacred duty is protecting the people against foreign invaders. It's a little bit old-fashioned, but nonetheless, it is, that's a sacred duty and natural hazards. So this should be right up there, number one, that it's not about stopping speculative human climate change, it's about being prepared for what Mother Nature is going to impose on you. And then there was the scandal of the, the climate gate emails. This was at the University of East Anglia where it seemed from the emails that, that were in the press that basically they'd been cooking the books. Yes, it's interesting. I mean, all of us shift slightly uncomfortably in our seats when a story like that breaks. Um, it's not at all clear whether the emails were hacked, which was the original claim, or more likely leaked by what's viewed as a whistleblower. At that stage, the moral issue shifts slightly because this is somebody on the inside who is privy to this information, who decides in the greater public good this information should be in the public domain because these people, these scientists, are not behaving properly. Not just any old research group was behaving in ways that are unscientific, but the world's premier climate research group, in many people's eyes, that provides the basic database that the United Nations uses in its intergovernmental panel, the temperature record for the last 150 years, that then New Zealand's government takes advice from these people so you take that chain all the way back down and the database is unrecoverable and they cannot reconstruct the way in which they constructed the temperature curve and it's very clear from the emails that all sorts of marginally scientific practices were being engaged in. And all the way through I guess the, the elephant in the room is the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which which seems to be behind all these things. And they seem to be the, the power that, that generates all the publicity and all the information about scary climate change. I think that is true. It's always been known by independent scientists that it was not a science organisation, it was a political organisation. But they've managed to present themselves up until about the end of last year as a science organisation. Now, th that's been completely exposed. Our government, both New Zealand and Australia, are signatories to what's called the Framework Convention on Climate Change. That is the UN umbrella under which the IPCC is organised. Now, if your government is a signatory to that Framework Convention, then this advice to you from the IPCC is official policy advice you have agreed to accept. You haven't agreed necessarily to implement an emissions trading scheme, but you've accepted that is the official conduit of advice. In both Australia and New Zealand, the public has been denied any due diligence, any scientific audit on that advice. And that is a scandal because the advice, as we now know in retrospect, and we suspected for a long time, is not science-based advice, it's political advice. It's not true to say that if an emissions trading scheme is passed, there'll be no benefit for New Zealand. There'll be a big benefit. People will feel better about themselves but you're going to pay an awful lot of money for that feel good. It's almost like when the public asks the questions, they ask the questions of the scientific reality, they want a scientific answer, but the answer comes from the political reality and so that they're, they're not getting the, the data that they need. Well, that's, I, I hadn't seen that myself, but that's perfectly true. And that's one of the reasons why it's useful to tease out these different realities, because in the public discussion it's a confused morass. So what is the answer? The answer is plan B. Plan A hasn't worked, won't work, can't work. You've got to have a plan B. Plan B is adaptation to climate change as it occurs. Contingent planning in the same way you do for an earthquake or a volcanic eruption. Bob, it's always good to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thanks, Alan.